Uh, for the second of our three-part series, I am Rabbi Kenningsberg from Magen Avot, and on behalf of Hendon United, Alei Zion and Magen Avot, delighted to welcome you all back once again. For those who missed the first part last week, um, the recording is available on YouTube, on Facebook, and on the US TV, so uh, you should be able to find that there. And last week, we were discussing more the mental health sort of angle of things. Tonight, we are changing focus slightly. We are going to be speaking about carrying on, keeping on top of financial employment and admin needs. And we have three uh, distinguished guests this evening, CEOs of different wonderful organizations in the community, helping people with employment, business, and different angles on that. We have Debbie Sheldon from Work Avenue, Baylor Perrin from Paperway Trust, and Victoria Sturman from Resource uh, for a fascinating, helpful, and practical conversation this evening. So without further ado, we hand over to Stephen uh, to moderate. Hi, thank you, Rabbi Kennesberg. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back uh, to, uh, as the rabbi said, part two, carrying on. Um, as per uh, our previous conversations, uh, we'll do the first part of this with me um, sending questions to our panelists and having them respond back. But then we will be opening the floor. Uh, so as always, if you've got any questions you'd like to ask at any point, feel free to drop them into the chat to, to me or to the group. Or you can raise your hand when we get to the, um, the questions section uh, later on, and I'll try and get to as many as I can. I'm sure there'll be no shortage of uh, questions. So um, I think in terms of an establishing piece, uh, you know, keeping on top of financial employment and admin needs, um, maybe I'll go first to Debbie Sheldon of Work Avenue. Debbie, can you, can you maybe just paint a picture for us, give us the overview on, on what your organisation, what Work Avenue, actually does? Sure. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, to be Schultz for inviting us um, and to inviting me to be here this evening. I'm not sure what's making me more nervous, having such esteemed Rabonim on the panel or my chair of trustees or my dad. So we'll <laughs> try and get through the evening. Um, Work Avenue, um, as I hope some of you have heard, uh, was established 15 years ago. And we're here for one reason, and that's to help people earn a living to support themselves and their families. How can you support yourself and your family? Well, you can do it in one of two ways. You can either work for yourself, have a business, or you can work for somebody else. You have to have a job. And Work Avenue helps people to be able to earn a living in both of these areas. And with your permission, if the tech is going to let me, I'd like to share, share a short clip, um, which will show you a little bit um, of what we are currently doing. So let's hope this is going to work. There we go. Welcome to Work Avenue. If you're looking for your next job, we can help you find it. One of our employment advisors will sit with you and discuss your career options, taking into account your skills, experience and preferences. We will work with you to make sure your CV reflects the roles you're seeking, thoroughly prep you for interviews and suggest suitable training to make sure you're presenting yourself in the best possible way. Best of all, we can put you forward for any of the roles on our jobs board that you may be suitable for. If you're thinking about starting a business or already run one, we're also here to help. You could sign up to our personalised advice sessions, brush up on skills like marketing and finance at one of our workshops, pitch your ideas or business to other entrepreneurs and let us introduce you to relevant business experts when you need them most. We also run regular events on topics of interest for all clients, including graduates, people in mid-career or professionals in certain key areas. Our events are held both in person or virtually if appropriate, with guest speakers and networking opportunities for all. You're also welcome to join us at our affordable shared workspace in Finchley and benefit from office space and meeting rooms. Becoming part of the Work Avenue family is your route to success. Okay, I, I hope you all saw and heard that. Just gives you a little flavor of what we're doing, helping people either to find jobs or to help them develop their businesses. And I think as the evening will progress, I'll, I'll go into more detail about that. I don't want to hog the limelight too much. Um, the shared workspace in Finchley is totally COVID secure and particularly of interest for people who are working from home. Um, many employers now like to bring their teams together every so often just to come together to meet once every week, once every two weeks. And we've got boardrooms and meeting rooms that people can hire out in total, totally COVID secure space. And I'm sure we'll get to it when we speak about flexible working later on, but there is an element of this combined uh, hybrid um, you know of being at home and coming together and we can help support people when they're doing that as well uh, since March we've taken all of our services online and remotely which has helped us reach a wider audience reaching really nationally and internationally but 
as I say, I'll uh, let the others speak and I'll tell you more about that a little bit later on. Thank you so much, Debbie. And, and to Baylor um, at the Paperweight Trust, uh, thank you so much for joining us as well. I guess the same question just told slightly, asked slightly differently just to establish uh, our first part of the evening, but can you give us a bit of a vignette, a picture of the, the, the services that people are currently looking to benefit from through the Paperweight Trust uh, of the last eight months or so? Sure, thank you. And thank you very much for asking me to, to join this evening as well. Um, and uh, yes, I'd like to give you a resume of um, all the various types of help that we're able to offer to clients who come to us. And we think as partners and as parents to children, um, as children to parents, our daily obligations require us to manage a variety of roles and to adapt our day to those demands. So in good times when life appears to be smooth running, we accept these roles and deal with the issues as they arise and some become familiar in routines, such as paying the bills and doing the shopping, keeping a home in semblance of order, being carers to our elders and our youngers. Other issues are more unfamiliar and, divide, and divert great energies and time. The ravages of mental illness, the downhill tumble associated with old age. But society has schemes and methods that we can adapt to, and with such tools, we persevere. And critically, there are those, I didn't see those coming type of issues, which can include sudden illness, death of a loved one, unemployment, abuse at home, and sometimes homelessness. And Paperweight was set up to help its now over 3,000 clients to manage their lives better in all or any of these circumstances. Our mantra is active crisis management. We provide a personal caseworker who holds your hand, who holds the client's hand through all the trauma to advocate forcefully and to write forceful and relevant letters and emails and to arrange beneficial repayments. Paperweight erects a barrier between the client and the harsh bureaucratic demands that come with a new and unwelcome territory. The very act of contacting an organization that is already on the caller's wavelength is already a source of comfort and relief. And Paperweight, among other things, will deal with housing and benefits, banks and probate, debts and creditors, officialdom in all its guises. And for those whose domestic life has an additional rough edge of abuse or neglect, Paperweight are there for family law matters, both civil courts and based in appearances, as well as the myriad bundles of paperwork and the forms that go alongside. We work hand in hand with every major and minor welfare organization in the community, within the community as well as outside the community, and we receive referrals from the local authority social care teams in all the London boroughs. Our services are free, discreet and tailor-made for clients specific set of crises. We all know that COVID has hit the community hard and has precipitated a tidal wave of problems unfamiliar to many. And to be honest, many of these problems are already very familiar to Paperweight, but the onset of COVID has increased our numbers dramatically. The spring brought an unprecedented wave of premature deaths. The speed of decline and helplessness of the best meaning medical teams added to the trauma of the survivors. Plans were hasty, arrangements were ill thought out, and the outside world had not adjusted itself to this new reality. Pre-COVID, first contact was often from a referring organization dealing with a person or family already known to them, and therefore, to some degree, already familiar with the institutional and governmental approach to their problems. Now, however, we have an entirely new cohort of applicants, bravely, and we are certain, after much heartache and despair, having the courage to pick up the phone themselves and tell a stranger Manning the paperweight helpline, I am out of my depth. We know, for example, the paperwork associated with the Department for Work and Pensions is new and confusing territory to many. The terminology is vague and those thrust into the jumble of claims forms and assessments may feel disorientated and disheartened. Our helpline assessors will take down essential details. The caseload will be assessed at allocation level and passed to a team trained in the areas of concern and within days, the client will already have had a one-to-one -one meeting from their specific caseworker who will devise a set of priorities and strategies to suppress the effects of these several crises. They will be sympathetic, but meticulous, knowledgeable and empathetic, but critically, they will learn to understand the client's specific situation. And they will, have, they will also have the massed ranks of our teams and their advisors to help resolve the matters as best as circumstances permit. Our teams of expert caseworkers are constantly updated on employment arrangements, 
the rights and obligations of employers as well as employees, and the ever-changing rules regarding rent and mortgage holidays, deferrals of credit card and bank payments are explained <coughs> in layman's language so that they can understand. Dialogue is opened up by paperweight with both the landlords and lenders to explain their client's position and the potential, potential plans of action and to express forcefully when necessary when the client is being unlawfully harassed. On the public front, Paperweight has hosted Zoom webinars with guest professionals who present various financial outcomes and arrangements arising from COVID with clarity and authority. And summaries of government schemes and timings are provided by bulletins and updated on the Paperweight website too. So to sum up, a client of Paperweight with whom COVID has struck one or more body blows will, as necessary, have the relevant benefit structures explained to new COVID families who have no previous experience of the system, particularly when applying for housing benefit and universal credit and the like. NHS employees and their financial arrangements for debt in services are addressed with urgency and compassion, and a focus on getting their paperwork delivered, complete and in approved time, to the government department who is handling the claim. Right. At all times, we endeavour to accelerate communication with outside parties to help stabilise the situation. The welfare of dependents, old or young, is also addressed, ensuring the right local authority department and the right communal organisations are brought into the frame. Where re-employment prospects seem slight, paperweight will signpost clients to job seeking and retraining organisations. And where domestic relations have reached crisis point, we provide directions to achieving reconciliation via mediation, though if matters have already passed these phases, we will provide family law guidance and navigate through court procedures and enable based-in presentations. Thanks, Baylor. Um, there's obviously a lot of detail to unpack, uh, which we can come back to over the course of the unit, but thank you so much for laying out such a comprehensive uh, spectrum of, of services from the Paperweight Trust. And just to uh, introduce Victoria Sherman, CEO of Resource. Evening, Victoria. You're muted. Sorry, still muted. That's all right. <laughs> so, all right. We're only early in the pandemic, so you know the muting <laughs> thing is still until 2021. It's still completely acceptable to be on mute for the first answer. Um, so uh, we've got your strap line here as as helping you to win the right job for you. And I've obviously got a personal interest here, given I'm a headhunter. But maybe just give us some kind of anecdote on on how how you go about doing that resource specifically. Okay, so uh, well, thank you so much for inviting me. Real honour to be here. Um, and um, so, at Resource, we we are also helping unemployed people to get back to work. Um, we were established um, almost thirty years ago uh, by Jewish Care, um, and um, our, our our vision is that no one should face unemployment alone. No one should face the the, the loneliness, the despair of unemployment on their own. How do we do this? Well, we tap into the skills and expertise of highly experienced professionals from our community who volunteer their time to help people. Um, we've got over 50 of them um, it, with a really wide range of skill sets um, and backgrounds. We've got management consultants, solicitors, HR professionals, pharmacists, marketers. There's, there's a very wide range. Um, and the volunteer advisor role is a, a very sought after role, actually. We have a very thorough recruitment process to select them. We're actually in an amazing position that we sometimes end up turning down more people than we take for this particular role. Uh, we offer continuous professional development for our advisors to keep them up to date and we observe them regularly. Um, so the way we work is to offer anyone who comes to us an initial no commitment of appointment with an advisor um, to talk about their situation. And, we describe it like a sort of a journey that um, clients go on with us, starting with initial appointment, working on their job search strategy, pre uh, preparing CVs together, application forms, wh whatever it needs really. Um, and alongside the work of our advisors, uh, we offer a series of relevant workshops um, that, that cover aspects of, of job search. Other services are uh, mock interviews, which are just so important, given that many people haven't been to an interview for years and it, they're absolutely excruciating yep. that first time round. Um, so mock interviews, one to one IT training, psychometric profiling, the, the, the list goes on. Um, so who uses our services? Well, people from every age, every walk of life, every profession, from the high flying CEO to the person with absolutely no work experience, no secular qualifications at all. Um, we like to see ourselves like professional cheerleaders, really supporting our clients with, with encouragement from the beginning to the end of their 
their job search. And, and we're helping around um, a thousand people um, each year. Like Baila mentioned, we work in partnership um, with, with a number of other organizations, uh, including Paperweight Work Avenue. Uh, we work regularly with Jamie, with Jewish Women's Aid, UJS, um, the list goes on. Um, we're also keen to focus on prevention and so keen to promote employability skills amongst teenagers and sixth formers. We go into uh, the Jewish schools, at least we did just before lockdown, to, right. just, um, to, to sort of teenagers and, and, and really start thinking about CV and job search skills um, before they, they get to uh, sort of later on in life when uh, you know, they, they have a well-developed CV. But just if I can just finally finish on just one last point, people often say to us, is there any point doing our job search or coming to you or anything when there are no jobs out there because of the pandemic? And just to sort of finish on this positive note, um, we really can, and I know Debbie and I have talked about this and feel the same, you know, we can dispel the myth that there are no jobs because of the pandemic or you should hold off because of the pandemic. There are lots of jobs available. They, they may not be in, uh, in travel, they may not be in events management, and they may not be exactly what you thought you wanted to go into, but with a strong CV, with, with good preparation, with plenty of interview practice, um, you know, the, the right job is out there for, for everybody. I would echo, thank you, Victoria. I would echo that from my perspective. Um, I think what I'm seeing, not to make this about, I'm here to interview you guys, but I would, I would endorse that. I've never been busier as a headhunter because uh, there is opportunity everywhere at the moment because people are pivoting um, what they thought was a done deal and actually placed a chief marketing officer in a, in a travel company uh, two weeks ago because they see the opportunity to do something different now. So everyone see, I think there is an enormous opportunity for executive and, and all hiring because the, it's the first time in his, human history where the entire world has pivoted its business plans together. So um, yeah, I, I would endorse that. Uh, not that my opinion massively counts in this, in this uh, exercise. But um, obviously we, we've mentioned how, you know, the pre and the post, well now mid COVID universe we find ourselves in. Maybe sticking with you, Victoria, for a second. You mentioned about um, schools being, um, uh, obviously schools now closed. So, you, well, they were closed for a while. So, and, and your access to them is limited. A, a question for all of you really, what have you found the way you've had to adapt and, and things that have come your way that outbound the incoming of the COVID pandemic, the way you've had to pivot. So Victoria, maybe we'll just quickly come to you and we'll, we'll reverse back up the ladder again. So we, we've thought long and hard about how to, to help people um, in this situation um, and, and how to provide the best support we can. And we've sort of got all, all advisors together to, to brainstorm. Um, but essentially um, we've moved all of our services to Zoom um, and, um, face to the, the face to face web, webinars uh, of seminars on our webinars um, we were very proud of that we didn't miss a day of, of training and support um, we started things like a weekly client newsletter um, with all information about um, job search about financial support available about mental health support um, we started coffee and chat sessions um, so that people could talk but essentially I think what we wanted to do is try and make sure people didn't get to get sort of left forgotten or, or, or left in despair so um, our relationship manager calls the people who didn't come to appointments and sort of right. you know check in on them so a lot more dialogue and, and a lot of zoom great and Bela I'm guessing you've similarly had to adapt yeah. well similarly as well we you know we're, we're all working remotely and we managed to um, organize that quite seamlessly um, but I think um, sometimes it's nice to be able to take uh, something good from something awful that's happened. And I think one of the things um, that we've taken that's good from COVID is the fact that it's really opened our eyes as to how we can um, help clients who don't live quite so close by. So if you're Zooming somebody, it doesn't matter if they're next door or you know, a long way away. So I, we've been astounded as to how our caseworkers are actually thinking outside the box as to how they can really help clients where previously we had um, really advocated face-to-face -face meetings, going to see clients in their home. I'd like to think that one day we can go back to that as well, because I, I think that that's a really precious thing to be able to do. Um, but for the moment, it, it, it's really helped us to, to help clients who are, who are living much further away um, and extend our services. Yeah, I think it has just changed people's expectation on what service actually could be. And, and Debbie, just come back up to you. And specifically, I understand um, you've been doing some work with special, I believe they're called community COVID grants. Maybe you could tell us a bit about those. Uh, yeah, as soon as um, lockdown happened, we realised that although the gov government had been really generous 
with the support that they were offering some people, many people were in fact going to fall through the cracks and not be eligible for the support. And we were really fortunate to be able to administer what was known as the Emergency Community Fund. The Jewish Leadership Council um, raised over 400,000 pounds, which we allocated um, to 235 households in the community um, to help them overcome that state of emergency. We were all in shock. We were all in panic back then. And especially with Pesach coming up, there was, there was you know, a lot of worry in the community for those who were not eligible. And um, we worked very closely with paperweight, especially to those who were going to be able to access benefits, but there was a lag um, from when that would happen to when they would be able to, to get it. So being able to be in a privileged position really of, um, handing out those grants to those um, who needed them was an amazing position to be in um, and actually really stood us in good stead because we uh, last week launched a new bursary fund for training courses in memory of our late trustee Richard Mintz and this is giving people the opportunity to apply for training course costs to be covered so that they can either retrain or train to work, which is something that people have wanted to do during the pandemic. A lot of people made use of free online resources, and now they want to take themselves a level further to be able to find those jobs. And I agree with Victoria completely. Those jobs are out there, but if we can train ourselves, especially in emerging markets or those markets that will be um, recruiting, then that's something very valuable for people to be able to do. Like everyone else, we've taken all our services online reaching a, um, a far a, a bigger a bigger reach and for us as well I think particularly as well as looking at people's transferable skills and where they can fit in the workplace the magic words that you used um, was the pivoting of a business plan and we support over 500 businesses per year um, and many of those had to think what now you know we can't sell in the same way as we were we can't market in the same way as we were what do we do now so those initial months of lockdown were really working with the businesses to think okay you've got you are where you are now what are the opportunities where can we reach and we've had amazing stories we've got people who are caterers who couldn't cater who started doing home chef business and really fantastic stories and they really are opportunities out there. I'm not here to say it's all rah-rah and brilliant because it's definitely been a challenging, challenging time for so many people, but with the right support um, that there are opportunities out there. Fantastic, thank you. I think that there is, we've always, in all the in all the conversations we've had, we're always trying to find a positive element and it's not to dismiss the negative, clear impact that has been felt, but yes, I think there are, these are not ordinary times and people are changing their perspective and mindset. Uh, and there, I think, and moves on to my next question, I think as well as trying to mitigate negativity with something positive, I think people are changing the way they live their daily lives. And so I was hoping I could come back to Baylor. And Baylor, obviously you are specialists in the way people can manage their own administrative control, their own um, paperwork, their financial situation. Now that we've all basically decided had to reset the way we think, is there any advice that we can all take on if we all want to do the same? How can we best prepare ourselves to be more efficient in terms of the management of our own affairs? Um, so, you know, uh, it's not easy for everybody. Uh, situations change, um, especially now with COVID, people find that the situations have, have, have changed overnight. Um, but the simple answer is to give us a call. Uh, we've got trained caseworkers who can help you and become involved in your problems immediately to, to help streamline your expenditure, direct you to areas where savings can be made, where you can find additional financial support. And we found countless of times that sharing uh, the issue and knowing that somebody is going to help you is already the first step to recovery uh, when you find yourself in a situation that you, where you've got nowhere else to turn. Um, but ignoring it as a slippery slope, it doesn't make it go away. Uh, brown envelopes become red envelopes and this is situation can exacerbate very, very speedily. And um, therefore, our people being able to go in and not being afraid of the bureaucracy and the administration allows us to help the client solve the problem so that they don't become a burden on the family and on the community. Right, thank you. Um, yeah, so question now, maybe I'll put this up, a, a, a spoil of riches here. Victoria, um, it will come back to you, uh, a resource. Um, there is, there's two sides to the employment piece, I think, during COVID, from my experience. There are those who have found themselves, unfortunately, tragically out of work. But I think everyone, whether they're in work or out of work, are, are reflecting en masse on the role that they're in or the situation they're in. And so you have the people who are kind of unhappily employed as well as unhappily unemployed. And I wonder if you're seeing that. There's a phenomenon that we're seeing, I'm seeing in my life, and I know that other people that I know in the community as well. So 
is that something which is filtered through to the work that you do? And, and how do you advise someone who's reassessing everything in their professional and personal life in the backdrop of the pandemic? Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, we see um, uh, plenty more uh, unhappily employed um, than ever. Um, and it's very, very difficult. Um, some of our advisors um, have observed that that some of our clients just seem to be going downhill um, each week that they're not successful in finding something different and a way out. And it's a vicious circle, as you know, I'm sure you would know, the, the, the longer it takes, the harder it is. And so it's even more important um, that, that, that we're there, that the work avenues is there, that people are there to, to support and make sure that you can sort of catch them and, and, and keep trying to, to motivate them, keep them positive. Um, I think the answer is to check in regularly with them um, keep speaking to them, encouraging them to take part in regular online events. Um, we often say that networking is one of the main routes to the job market. And so the, the more they can keep that up, the more they can network, the more they can have conversations, they can chat to people, uh, the more likely it is that they will uh, be successful. Um, and, and another thing to do is just share stories. You know, we, we have a lot of uh, success. Um, in fact, um, September and October were our best months in terms of clients getting jobs um, since the beginning of, of the pandemic. And I think that for most people, that really is quite motivating, you know, to know that 36 of our clients got jobs in, in October, 23 um, so far um, in November. Um, and, um, and then when things get really tough, you know, we, we call upon partners. So for example, um, a Jamie um, advisor will join us at one of the meetings um, and then we'd have a three-way meeting um, to just sort of put a plan into place for somebody to, to you know, try and prevent them from, from um, and really going into despair. I've said, thank you. I, say, I, think, I do think it's wonderful that there's a such cross engagement between the community and the fact we had Jamie represented last week and the fact that you work together is really heartening, I think, um, for the community you know, these, this, there is a very strong line between people's professional and personal lives and their mental health and their and their personal lives. So I think that's a, it's a wonderful endorsement of the community uh, structure that we're all a part of. Um, Debbie, coming back to you um, on a question, um, obviously you are at the centre of what is the kind of entrepreneurial um, heartbeat of our community. You see all different businesses, entrepreneurs, ideas, professionals coming through your doors. I wonder if you can just, before this gets too negative and depressing, maybe give us a positive sense of what is the spirit of entrepreneurship like in the community currently? Are we, a, oh, you know, is, is this a standout kind of generation in our community of entrepreneurs and business people? Don't know about standout generation. I do know that um, we are, our makeup, our DNA um, gives us a propensity to be able to, you know, find challenges and be able to find a solution and find a way through. And there were for sure a huge number of people um, between March and the summer who were placed on furlough, who looked at it as an opportunity to try that business that they've always been trying uh, or wanting to try. And they've never been able to do it because they've had a full-time job. Um, and I think the story that one of our clients told me was probably really um, interesting and a perspective that I hadn't really thought about. Um, he was, he was in, in the performing arts um, sector and clearly that completely shut down and he kind of knew that he should try something else because this wasn't a grown-up job that his mum kept on telling him he had to get a proper job but he thought if he would step away from what he was trying to do everyone else would supersede him and would sort of be higher up the ladder than he would and he when we spoke to him and we gave him advice we were able to say look this is your chance to try something now and um, he's creative and he's entrepreneurial and we are helping him build and develop a business now uh, that he would never have been able to do beforehand um, similarly we're working with a lot of people um, performers um, bands photographers to look at different ways of being able to use their art and use their talents in a way that they they can now some of them try things both ways. They try and find a job and they try and, and start a business. And they see which one will work better for them. Um, but we've had unbelievable, we've had um, retail, our retail businesses having unbelievable success of selling online. People were buying uh, more popcorn online than you can ever remember them that was being sold in the shops before. So um, we've definitely got a, a positive spin and a buzz. If you come into our shared workspace um, in Finchley, there is, although there's a lot of perspex screening going on, there's a, there's a massive buzz around and there's a lot of support. We, um, the hub gives where we are in Finchley, we hub, 
gives entrepreneurs support one for another. And you'll see on a WhatsApp group, people saying, join this networking event, come, come and see, you know, stand up here, work, learn your elevator pitch here. And um, we've got a virtual networking event this coming Thursday for entrepreneurs to be able to literally network in breakout rooms together like they were networking beforehand. And um, between you and me, it's slightly less frightening to network on Zoom than it was walking into a big room of people who you don't know. So um, there are definitely opportunities here. And um, I can say in the community, we're seeing a lot of success, thankfully. Good stuff. Um, that's really important um, to share, I think. And uh, Baylor, a, a, a kind of open question to you as well, just whilst we stay on the optimistic theme. Are you seeing anything in your work that gives you grounds for optimism, either in the way people are behaving, the way people have adapted, uh, anything you can share to kind of in an uplifting way? Um, I think, you know, I think as well to, to echo what Debbie said, people are opening their minds to, to new situations and, you know, we're, our case work is opening their minds to new situations as to how we can deal with uh, with our clients and the successes that we're that we're getting, and I think it's also understanding um, the people to whom we're to whom the case that we're speaking to, um, and to understand that they're also working in isolated and, and difficult conditions, and and building up a rapport and a relationship with uh, an officer at the HMRC who has piles of files on on the desk at home um, can be more sympathetic to a mutual client's plight if our caseworkers present the facts and figures with. Um, you know, humility and, and humanity and, and even a bit of humour in a nice, calm way. And we're finding that that can pay huge, huge dividends. Um, you know, so it, it, it's, you know, it's an attitude that's, that's you know, that, that's really very important. And um, I think also uh, to, to highlight a recent case that we've had as well, where um, sadly one of our clients' uh, husband uh, passed away. He was an NHS frontline worker. Um, he suddenly passed away back in April. And... Um, as a, if you are a frontline worker um, who, who passed away as, from COVID, you are entitled to a government grant of sixty thousand um, pounds. So that seems all marvellous, but it's not quite as marvellous as it seems because um, it doesn't tell you how difficult it is to actually access that sixty thousand pounds and the hoops that you have to go through in order to be able to 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 get that money into your bank account. Um, so one of our clients, one of our caseworkers involved with one of those clients, um, had has been working for six months with sheer determination um, and keeping calm and building up relationships with um, dozens of, of departments, pushed from pillar to post, MPs, probate office, uh, the NHS department, health minister himself, Matt Hancock, um, dozens of emails. And finally, um, last week, she got the 60,000 pounds into a bank account. And that was quite a result. Um, and I believe that many others in that situation have not yet received their money. So you know, that's quite a travesty. Um, and also, as Debbie said, uh, challenges of COVID can, um, can lead to those who are open to it, uh, previously unthought of new, new opportunities. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when we were speaking last week with um, Jamie and Jewish Women's Aid and the, and the Drugs Addiction Helpline, I think one of the most powerful conversations we had was around the idea that the people who are on this call, uh, who were on the call last week, some of them may be dialing in for a personal purpose as in you know god forbid they they require some extra help last week or they require help this week but i think what's equally powerful is there are plenty of people on this call who are happily employed or or beyond employment now you know maybe retired or you know are, are comfortable but have come on because they want to see if they can help others if they encounter people who need the kind of help that, that the three of your organizations can can provide so i guess as an open question if we're all advocates for your organizations can you just tell us like what we can do to be of help to you? Either a message that we can advocate on your behalf, people we should be seeking out, um, maybe it's behaviors we should be seeking out and how just so we can be an extension of you. Cause I think that's the real power of, of people spending an 8.30 or 9.30 on a, on a freezing Monday night on a Zoom call. Um, some of us have had 15 Zoom calls today already or various iterations of it. So maybe I'll come back to Baylor um, and but just briefly, if you will, the three of you, because I want to make sure um, we open to questions. So you're all on, consider yourselves all on notice as the question session coming. So Bela, how can we help you and Paperweight in the community? Um, well, I think one of the things that Paperweight does very well is we, we garner a lot of expertise that's already within the community. Um, so we have a lot of people coming to volunteer their time with us because they understand what we do. Um, and they clearly, um, I, I think when, when somebody volunteers uh, their time for an organization, They'll do so for an organization with which they feel an affinity. So, you know, if you're good with animals, if you're good with, with illness, or you're good with, you know, with, with, with giving lifts to hospitals, 
So I think the people that already come to uh, People Week to volunteer their time is because they already understand the sort of help that we're giving and they feel that um, it's within, you know, it's within their strength, within their capability to, they're not phased by forms and paperwork, they're not phased by the, 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 you know, the suit at the end of the line, they understand how to advocate um, and they can really feel and understand the client and, 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 and that's, you know, that's, that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, they put themselves, they, they're empathetic, they put themselves in the, in the client situation, the client's shoes and you've, you've got a really good partnership going on and, and, and the results speak for themselves. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Victoria, same question to you. How can we, the community and the, the interested few on the call, how can we amplify your message and who should we be um, who should we be seeking out to maybe connect to you? I, I mean, I think the first thing I do is just make sure that they know about the organisations uh, that are available to help them in, in our community. As, as you said, we've got fantastic uh, support, incredible organisations. Um, and to, um, but, but not everyone knows that we're here. Um, and um, we, we hear every day of people who have sort of said, I wish I'd known about Resource and Work Avenue, you know, when I'd lost my job and I didn't know. So um, that's the first thing. Um, but I'd say, you know, if you're supporting um, a partner who um, has unfortunately lost their job or been made redundant, um, I think um, the idea of being supported without too much questioning, without too much pressure, um, our clients often tell us that they, the, their, their worried spouse, you know, often worried, you know, understandably about finances, about status, about perceived stigma, things like that can actually really, really uh, push their, their partner um, and cause a lot of a lot of problems. So and, and thirdly, I'd say encourage um, them to, to tell everyone to, to make it known, you know, use the networks and, and within our community, we are, we are very well networked, we're very well connected and we are uh, very generous with our networks, actually. So um, um, and then, and finally, if anyone would like, uh, if anyone has the skills um, and would like to find out more about volunteering for resource, I uh, would always love to hear from you. Brilliant, thank you. And same question to Debbie. Yeah, we've got you. Thank you. Um, so I'd like, yeah, really echoing um, a lot of what Victoria said, networking and connecting people is, is, is really important. I think what Victoria said earlier as well, just checking in with someone, are you okay? Um, I think it's, it, we're slightly more aware of it now, but certainly before the pandemic, you'd sort of meet someone out somewhere and say, hi, how do you do? What do you do? And asking that what do you do question could be really, really difficult when someone isn't able to give the answer that they would love to give. So I think it's being aware of, of, of conversations and, and, and how you speak and aware of the other person. Um, of course, there are so many youngsters now who are desperate to put stuff onto their CV. So if there are any people who are able to invite someone in in a COVID way or to, to shadow via Zoom um, so someone can put some work experience on their CV, that would be absolutely fantastic for the next generation coming forward. And we're really, really excited that in the new year, we're going to be la launching a new initiative, which is a social enterprise where we're going to be providing training in, in the emerging markets that we spoke about, the, the areas that there will be work, um, and an opportunity for people to have mentored paid employment. So they will be carrying out real tasks, getting paid for it, and being watched over and quality assured by people who understand this work. And like you say, if there are people who are no longer in active employment and who have got time to give, they should definitely be in touch with us to see how they can participate in that program. Thank you. That's amazing. So just to be clear, to, I mean, because there's two sides to this, there's the supply side and there's the demand side. So I agree wholly. I'm, I, I mentor and advise a lot of young graduate kids who are looking for their first jobs and people who are, who are tenured in employment are struggling to get jobs. There's no real appetite to start graduate programs and give people their first hit. Do, do you have in Work Avenue, do you have a, a live database of young people looking for work experiences right now? Absolutely. We've got live work data, uh, database people looking for work experience opportunities. We have got um, a, a live jobs board, so employers telling us um, what opportunities there are. Um, but we are also very aware that, um, just cu coming back to your point, that you say that you know, there are people who, who are not necessarily going to get their first job on the supply and demand side. That for us is where the magic happens because mm. we've got these 500 businesses who are demanding services, who right. are growing their business and haven't actually taken that somewhere else before. So with our business advisors, we're able to guide them to grow their business and to be able to procure business 
um, and to give tickets out to those people just starting out on their job in this mentored work. Fantastic. Now, I was going to say just a very practical thing that we can do if anyone is in that does have their own business or has the capacity to mentor and take on work experience in their own entrepreneurial business or they sit on a board of a business or they have access to an organization then you know you'd be doing an incredible thing to give access to your doors and knowledge to someone who would bite your arm off for the chance to potentially have a life-changing career experience with you that gets them on the, on the that's something we can all do right now if you're on the call now and you have a space for a young graduate who wants to earn their stripes then i guess you should contact um debbie victoria Bailey, and anyone else in the community that can help fabulous um, I think we're going to move on to questions. We've got about 20 minutes. We can all be off by half nine um, and you go back to your evenings. Um, so uh, first question is coming from Rabbi Ginsbury. Uh, I don't know if that's meant to be anonymized, but he's a, he's a very good question. I guess uh, and anyone who wants to answer this can answer this really, I guess. But very, very pragmatically, can you give us any advice between you of people, how, how, for people who may be struggling with reducing their income, with people who are struggling with reduced income, uh, or, or debt in, in, the, in the rapid changing environment that they found themselves in over the last few months. Anyone want to come in on that? Baylor, do you want to take that yeah. first? <laughs> your bread and butter, and then I maybe will give a couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, give us a call. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is our bread and butter. This is what our caseworkers are trained to do. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of different kinds of debt. Um, not to the extent, you know, there's, it depends on the amount. Um, but this is something that our caseworkers are trained to do and will help the client to, um, to, to be in touch with, depending on sort of this, this credit card debt or, or, or wherever the debt is, or sometimes it's debt over multiple, um, uh, you know, from multiple sources. So we will look, you know, they will look at that and they will be able to work out very, um, you know, very quickly with the, with the client and work out the payment terms. Um, and be in touch with, uh, you know, the, the worst thing is, is when people are, are owing money is, you know, for example, if it's utilities, that there's, there's no dialogue going on. Um, and then, you know, the utility, the utility companies will get um, very stressed and, and they will start issuing the red letters and the bailiffs will come to the door. But once they know that we're involved with the client and you know, we're organizing things with them, we can put a stop to um, all the correspondence immediately and get to look to the client situation and, and organize things for them from there. So but the, you know, the, my advice is not to leave things until, you know, they're, they're coming out of, going out of control, but to contact us before that so that we can really help um, get to the grips of things before, before it's too late, before the, before the bailiffs are at the door. Uh, I think Debbie, you might, you might want to, you said you might want to come in with yeah, something. Just from our experience from running the emergency community fund and from, from the bursary fund that we're, we're running at the moment, um, we're working with our clients just to sort of show them that we don't have to keep up with the Joneses. I think Corona has helped a lot of people with that. There are a lot of people who felt they really had to maintain a certain lifestyle. And when Paperweight works with them and shows them what, they've got, what their income is and, and what they can afford to do, there are ways to reduce costs that they haven't really thought about before because they haven't had to. Um, and we found in the bursary um, process, just, just asking questions like you know, your utility bills and and you know where they think they have to buy all their children matching clothes for Pesach or whatever it is. There are ways of living to be able to live within their, their budget. And I think now there's um, hopefully a lot more of an understanding for that with, um, I think pre-COVID possibly we were on this hamster wheel. We were trying to go round and round and higher and higher and more and more and new and new. And I think now we've been able to take a, a bit of a break, take a deep breath and say, this is who I am. There's a bit of reality now injected into our lives and let's be honest about who we are and let's try to maintain the lifestyle that we can afford. I think that's actually a kind of generate, I think that's actually one of the biggest insights from this entire thing that we've all been yanked off the treadmill uh, for the first time in human history. The, the treadmill for everyone is, and we're starting to reassess what is real and what was just, you know, what was running away from us. And I think, I think you're quite right. Also just to flag, there is a, there is an organization if anyone interested called Masila UK um, who can help with financial management and their executive director is Rabbi Benji Landau. Um, so if anyone is struggling or wants to refer anyone to this, yet another organization in our, in our community uh, that can help. Um, of course, keep bringing your questions. I, I guess another question for me would be, um, prior to COVID hitting, um, hopefully you had a sense of what we should see on the back of this. Now, now we're in a 
Now we're in a world where there's a there's a few vaccines that are about to be deployed. We understand an infinite amount more than we did. I just was wondered if the three of you could give us some forward projected views on, on what we think the back of this looks like and how your organizations will change accordingly. So maybe we'll come to Victoria first. Um, okay. So sort of various different levels. On the, on the one, um, I think the world of work um, is going to have changed forever. Um, you know, there's no doubt there's been some, a lot of negatives of COVID, but there have been some positives as well. So, um, you know, we, we've all been able to spend more time with our families. We've, you know, not sat uh, in the traffic um, on a on commute. You know, we've uh, um, had, uh, have sort of loads more time in our day uh, because of, uh, of not commuting. Our, you know, life um, has been uh, more relaxed the pace. Um, and I think our uh, work uh, sort of flexibility um, is increased such that um, you know people can work around for example school pickups now I know plenty of people now who 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 get their day's work done but they they, they pick their kids up from school give them their tea you know sort of uh, settle them down and then go back to work for the evening and so um, people are able to um, consider applying for jobs that they may not have done before um, lockdown and before this new sort of uh, welcoming of flexibility and indeed resource uh, is one of those because we were um, before uh, the pandemic an organisation who I think a bit like Baylor said very much felt that we needed to see people in person and we needed to be working in the office and it needed to be fixed hours and everything um, and and so wrong we were you know it's worked brilliantly um, as it has for, for, for many people so I think that that um, is something that's going to change um, a lot and um, a different picture is going to be about the recession and uh, the the unemployment. You know, we, unemployment was at the lowest uh, figures. You know, sort of three point nine percent lowest since records began, and you know already we're sort of four point eight percent or something today. And and that, so that's a different uh, question that I could let Debbie talk about. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a very it's a very neat segue back to Debbie. Thanks, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, I agree with, with everything you've said, although I, I've got a slightly different take on it. Um, I do think we will see uh, flexible working carrying on. Um, but and there are some businesses um, that have had have completely closed their offices and they want to only work from now on going home. House is one of them that is just completely never going to have um, employees um, in offices again. They're going to save all their commercial um, property prices. I actually don't think that's going to keep going on forever. I think, I hate to tell you all this, but I think the world of the gala dinner will come back again. I think someone in a couple of years will say, hey, I've got a really good idea for a different fundraising idea. Why don't we have a dinner? Have I, do, I, do, <laughs> I do think we're gonna come out of this because I think people need people. And like everyone, like it, it has worked really well for us um, to be able to work remotely and to see people over Zoom. There is something I believe missing in the in the face to face. And the way I describe it with my team is that we're all fantastically reactive. And I think I mentioned this to you, Stephen, when we spoke. You know, we work really well. We do whatever needs doing. But it's that creativity and that um, bouncing ideas off each other and brainstorming and the big pieces of paper on the other sides of the room. I do think we are going to, to go back to that when it's safe to do so. Um, with keeping a little bit of the flexible working and the understanding of the importance. And I hope we don't forget all the things that we've learned over the last few months. I, I do think we will we will go back. But to, to try and answer your question, what does the future look like? So I've alluded to it a little bit um, with the social enterprise that we're launching, which, which is huge for us. But for us, it's really important to help our clients um, understand where the, the where there will be jobs and where they will be able to find jobs and how they need to prepare themselves um, for that job market. And they can access more opportunities now than they were able to before. And not to miss this window. If I feel things are going to go back, I might be wrong, but there is a window of opportunity here and people need to be encouraged to maximize that opportunity. That's exactly right. Um, I, I'm speaking with a, a client of mine who based in Buenos Aires and he works in a, a New York Stock Exchange listed business. And he was saying that Zoom calls and, and uh, digital calls, they, they they take about 400% of the energy that you would normally have in a conversation because you put your energy into a screen and a camera, but you get nothing back. So it's physically exhausting. And I can absolutely vouch for that. And there is a disconnect at the moment between this solution. It's like a 1.0 solution. It's not the same. And so his company are developing a concept of augmented collaboration, 
which isn't just getting on a Zoom call. And to your point, Debbie, of that two minute sense check you might have when you walk over to a desk. If you don't have that, you don't, you don't just click on a Zoom for two minutes. Um, and that will be the next generation of this. And I think you're right. I think people will want to instinctively get back to big offices and big gala dinners and big tables. Um, probably won't spend as much as they did. Uh, and the Canary Wharf will be a ghost town. Uh, but yes, I think humans are humans and they want to be close to each other. Um, a question from Miriam Friedman, and it kind of harks back to a question that we asked last week, which is, uh, I'll read out um, the question. Uh, it's great that all of these organizations have such a fantastic set of volunteers that they can call on. But equally, you must all need to raise your income to continue your services. Have you lost streams of income that you could previously rely on, I guess, through, that, through fundraising or, um, or through statutory funding? And how have you adapted your fundraising processes accordingly? Maybe I'll start with Baylor on that one. So um, I think as far as paper is concerned, we've been sort of a more, because we're very volunteer orientated, we've been a more low cost organization, but of course, even a low cost organization needs to, um, needs funds to, in order to operate. And of course we've lost out as much as anybody else pro rata. Um, and it is very difficult. So, um, you know, we looked, you know, I'm going to start, uh, um, you know, uh, advocating for us, uh, um, you know, in this uh, forum, but obviously, you know, us as well as Work Avenue and, and Resource and every other organization uh, are struggling um, and will continue to struggle. And um, for the moment, and especially at the moment where in COVID our, our clients, our, the client numbers are, raising quite significantly. So we've got to make sure that we, we're able to provide the service uh, in as good a way as we possibly can. And, and so fundraising is always at the top of our agenda and, and, and it's a struggle. Thank you. Um, and Victoria? Um, yeah, so very, very similar to Bela. Um, uh, we are, because we're volunteer led, uh, our costs are minimal and we keep them to an absolute minimum. And so, it um, hasn't been too difficult. We're also fortunate to take advantage of um, some uh, emergency funding that various um, organisations, foundations, uh, Nat National Lottery and others um, were uh, giving, would give us to, to help us um, adapt and keep going. Because as Bela said, just the same, we're having to help more people uh, with, with less to go around. But we put out an appeal for more volunteers um, to come forward and we had a huge response and uh, we selected uh, four new volunteers to start um, last month. So um, really it's, it's, it's people that we need. Um, and yes, But it's a mistake to think just because it's volunteer led that there's, there's no office costs and there's no base costs because yes. they, you know, they climb pro they climb per rata quite significantly. Yeah, thank you. And Debbie? Yes, so um, exactly like Victoria said, we have been really lucky to benefit from some um, emergency grants that have been given out. The National Lottery awarded us a grant and we were able to purchase laptops. Um, and there was a point during lockdown where um, we were speaking to families. They had one mobile phone and they were trying to homeschool four children using one device and they were really struggling. So we're now in a position to be able to lend laptops out um, to people who need them who don't have the devices. Um, even just for people's job search, they don't have to be homeschooling anybody for whatever they might need um, to use the laptop for. Um, and we've um, recently got more, more, some a little bit more emergency funding, but there's no doubt about it. We have really suffered. Um, we usually have our business awards um, in the summer, which didn't happen in June 2020. And we were supposed to have our gala dinner this year, which was obviously cancelled. And we did that um, very deliberately. We stepped back at the beginning because all the welfare organizations had an emergency appeal from the community and it was really important that they should you know the care homes and they, they should all be able to raise the funds straight away um, and we stepped back and we waited um, but I'm afraid now is our time and in um, January the 17th and 18th we are going to be doing one of these crowdfunding um, campaigns which lends, them, well, it lends itself brilliantly to corona no one has to come anywhere they just have to press the donate button on their phone and we really hope that all the community will join us um, in trying to raise the funds that we need to be able to help people back into, the, into work and hopefully they in turn will be able to join that virtuous circle and donate when they're in a position to do so. I'm sure they will, I'm sure they will. Um, thank you for your question Miriam. Um, we've got five minutes um, before we end so if anyone's got a last question to jump in the chat do so now and and, uh, and whilst you're thinking about the, the question if you have one. Um, I just want to Again, I said last week, um, and I, I really think it's important, we should end these nights with a sense of positivity and optimism. 
uh, if we can. There's enough depressing stuff going on in the world in 2020. And um, I wonder if you can just give us, and I'll put you on the spot here because no one's prepped this at all, but if you have one, and I won't come to you, you I'd rather you just shout out because if you haven't got one, then that's understandable. But if not, if one doesn't come to mind, but can anyone just give us a kind of a really lovely vignette of some wonderful achievement or activity that's that's touched one of your users uh, or clients um, in the past eight months or so that you know that makes you really kind of bounce out of bed in the morning and to, to go into work because there are in an, all these tragedies and negative stories there are incredible things happening so maybe I'll come to oh there Debbie's got a hand up go on. so thank we, you <laughs> we had pleasure we had so many stories um, of people when we ran the emergency community fund at the beginning and a gentleman that really touched so many of our hearts was someone who was a cab driver and of course he lost his business instantly um, and he had, well, had to at the beginning self-isolate because he was caring for a, young, a younger brother in his um, 60s I think it was who was vulnerable um, so it was, it was a terribly sad story and he didn't have any income but then he contacted me in June he said you know you were so kind and you gave me so much hope um, I can't go back to being a cabbie. What can I do? Um, and it just, I have to say, I'm sure Victoria and Baylor will agree with me, doing our work for the community, timing is everything. And when you need something, something just seems to appear. I don't know, you know, hashkacha, whatever you want to call it, it, it oh, things yeah. happen at the right time. Um, and just at that time, I had read an article um, about many people moving house and about people needing removal services. Um, and he was a very competent driver and we worked with him and he had a lorry and he started up in his area of Essex doing house removals and he loves speaking to people. So he doesn't have that cabbie interaction, but he's, it makes, it forms relationships with people when they're moving house and he's, he's now developed a different but thriving business. Fantastic, what a great story. Right, this should, and I'm afraid for uh, Victoria and Baylor that uh, Debbie set you a pretty high bar there. So. <laughs> um, I just, just, just so many. I'm in the fortunate position of, of getting the uh, the emails and calls daily from people saying that they they've got a job and they're just so so thrilled that they you know they they can sort of raise their head up high again. And um, one of the things I, I I like the most is is um, somebody who um, was persuaded to set up a LinkedIn profile and we spend a lot of time talking about LinkedIn as an extension of what I was saying earlier about networking. And many of our clients are nervous about LinkedIn um, being a sort of social media platform. There's so many reasons why they might be nervous of putting themselves out there and photographs and everything else. So uh, we, we generally uh, are successful at persuading people and we run two different workshops on LinkedIn, an introduction to LinkedIn and, a, and an advanced session. Um, and um, not long ago, somebody was persuaded to, to create a profile uh, with our help and, uh, and, and that day, somebody contacted her via LinkedIn um, saying they'd seen her, her profile and uh, in fact she was looking for a fundraising position and, and, and then it was a former colleague who'd seen her and she sort of said that she was recruiting at the moment um, and that they would arrange an interview and uh, to cut a very very long story short it did lead uh, to a job quite quickly and this, this lady is happily employed now. Well, phenomenal and I think happily employed now are the three ideal words to end uh, this evening on. I just want to extend an enormous thank you on behalf of the communities of Raleigh and United, Magena Vart and Aletion, to our speakers, to Debbie, uh, to Victoria, to Baylor. Thank you so much for, first of all, taking the time this evening and all the prep that went into it, but also for everything that you do in the community. I think one eye-opening piece of the last couple of weeks of talks is a lot of the work, and I say every time I speak to anyone who works in the community, there's a lot of this work that silently goes on that some of us that don't have to rely on it I don't even know goes on and the fact you all interact with each other both on this call and this call this this meeting to late last week's meeting it's a really incredible thing that you do for all of us um whenever we need you and so I hope people can come forward to either spread your message donate to your fundraisers uh donate their time their expertise their businesses and we're all very very uh lucky and we're better for having you in our community so thank you so much thank you all for coming as well and wishing everyone a Hanukkah Sameach on Thursday night. Keep warm, keep dry, keep safe. And the next talk is uh, next, I want to say next week, I've just lost it on my screen. There you go, fabulous. Uh, and is, um, oh, I've just lost it. Feel free to jump in at any point. I think we're back here next Sunday uh, for the final, oh, next Monday, I should say, for the final, next Monday for the final talk. And um, wishing you all a great week. And thanks for coming. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you for having us. Facilitating, Stephen. Stephen.
Yes. Can I just jump in and take Rabbi's prerogative sort of thing first to thank our panelists and thank you as well, just both for this week and last week. And just a heads up for next Monday evening, which will be a special uh, Hanukkah event. A little bit of light dispels a lot of darkness. We've got a most fantastic guest speaker, Rabbi Dr. Ari Sitner, Director of Leadership and Community Development at Yeshiva University of New York, Professor of Social Work, Therapist and Author, all rolled into one, and that will be followed by a brief discussion between myself and my colleagues here, Rabbi Kenigsberg and Rabbi Rosla, moderated by our indefatigable and modest uh, technical wizard, Rabbi Tzvi Portnoy, to whom we're indebted for uh, providing the, uh, the uh, Zoom platform for this and the other evenings we've been uh, having. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening and thank you to our wonderful presenters really tremendous appreciation thank you so much thank you for having us thank you, thank you.